Good afternoon in Europe. But it's good morning here in Atlanta. We are up again, and we've started this new series, the Quarantine Film Series. Uh, I'm your host, Kabir Segel. You may be familiar with what we're doing with musicians. That is the Quarantine Concert Series, and tonight is concert number 49 in 30-something days, and it occurred to me, uh, my friend uh, Shane Abudo and I had finished our first movie, and we were applying to all these film festivals, and they were all canceled. And so just as the concerts have been canceled, so have the, so have the film festival has been canceled. And, you know, the there's so many great films that are out there, and these are top-notch film festivals. The uh, Tribeca Film Festival, South by Southwest, they're all gone. And so... Now, what can we do to use a platform to shine the light on some of the artists, some of the incredible directors that have made films that we were interested in seeing and we were interested in, in being a, a part of and learning more about? And so over the last few weeks, we've been talking to directors and we said, why don't we use this platform and spotlight the people who deserve it, the artists and people involved in the film world? So that's what this series is all about. We're doing these um, the film interviews in the morning because um, we're doing the concerts at night and you can only do so, do so many of them. Uh, but we thank your support, and the content lives on. And you can find us on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, YouTube. We haven't started Instagram for these yet, but we might. So, and of course, ask a comment. You know, we'll be, be happy to um, ask the director um, and get them to opine. Um, and the more interactive we can make this, the better. Because, you know, you can't see these movies yet. So if you want to ask questions about the craft or the making, just feel free to do it. All right, so with that... That's what we're doing with the Quarantine Film Series, um, and now I want to introduce our incredible guest. Um, he is a, a talented director, um, a talented director. He made this wonderful movie called Insert Coin, which um, I think we should all see. Anyone who uh, grew up playing video games has to see this movie, because when we, when my friend Shane, Shane and I saw it, we were like, yeah, we played all those games. We loved all those games. Please welcome um, to the show the wonderful filmmaker, Josh Sway. Welcome. Hey guys, how are you? Thanks for having me on. Of course. Tell me first, uh, where are you broadcasting from? Uh, I'm from Chicago, Illinois. Well, actually, I should say the Chicago area. We just uh, recently moved uh, outside of the city, but I'm still a Chicago one at heart. Gotcha. And what's quarantine life like for you right now? Wow, um, I'm really making use of my <laughs> my basement office uh, for one. So you know, that's uh, when we moved out here. I thought, oh, it'd be so nice to have my own office. And I ended up never really using it, and now it's coming. It's coming super handy. So. It's been nice, you know, everybody is at home, but we have enough space that uh, we can get away from each other when we need to. Yeah, tell me, uh, exactly, I think we're all hunkered down like that. Tell me, um, what were you planning to do? What was the plan for your movie, for your director career? What were you hoping to do that sort of been put on hold or canceled outright? Yeah, I, you know, so I may, yeah, you know, I had been working on Insert Coin for the last few years or so, and, um, and you know, it's funny. It's it's kind of ironic. The original idea was I was going to make this film just kind of just to make a film, just kind of get it out of my system. And I never really thought I was going to do um, the film festival circuit. And um, but towards the end, you know, I, you know, somebody had mentioned to me, hey, you know, South by Southwest seems like it's a it's a great venue, you know, for this film just because of the, you know, the um, the combination of just you know arts, culture, video games, and technology. So I entered it in there, and um, and you know, to my delight, it got it got uh, you know got accepted. And so from there, um, it a lot of things happened. After it got into South by, it got into a bunch of other film festivals, um, you know, just because of the PR around it and everything. And so, so what became a last minute decision to go to the film festival circuit became really big. But then next thing we know, obviously, we see that you know the the world has changed. And uh, and a bunch of these film festivals got canceled. South by obviously being the uh, the biggest one. So it kind of threw a curveball into my plans. But I because my original plans didn't have didn't really have film festivals in it. My you know, mentally I was I was okay with it. I mean obviously I was very bummed out about it, you know, and such. But you know I kind of had already had a uh, a plan B by proxy, um, which was basically hey you know I just want to get you know, I just want to get a get it out to the market, uh, work with um, an established um, you know sales agency, and get it shopped around. And so that's still the plan going forward. Obviously, the film festival part 
would have been a part of that plan, but it's still, you know, it's still moving forward. Gotcha. I love the the title of the movie, Insert Coin. It, you know, uh, it evokes memories of going into the arcade <laughs> and, and, and playing when I was growing up with, with my friends or sometimes uh, alone. I was a alone or gamer sometimes. Uh, but tell me, um, why did you want to tell the story of Midway Games? What about it attracted you? Because making a movie takes several years of your life. Why did yeah. you want to spend that much time working on a project like this? Well, yeah, it's for this one. It was actually it was a very personal project. Um, I had worked at Midway Games from in the '90s, so from the early '90s up to up to um, '99 or towards the tail end of '99. And so the film is about um, that same era that I was working there at. And so I was very intimate with the storyline. I knew all the people that, you know, like I, I lived through that whole era where Mortal Kombat became huge, NBA Jam became huge, arcades suddenly had a big resurgence after the 80s, you know, games like NARC really brought new technology in. So I, I was very intimate with the story and the people behind it. So when I, you know, I had left Midway to, to do some other pursuits, but I always kept in touch with everybody. And lo and behold, 20, 25 years later, um, I started realizing that, you know, people love these games. They're a big part of their childhood. And there's never been a story about just holistically about what that studio was like and how these games came to be. There, you know, you see a lot of like, let's say YouTube videos and such talking about these games individually, but nobody really had the whole story around it. And I thought I was in a unique position to tell that story um, and give it the proper context. And so, you know, beyond that, I just really wanted to make a film. I went to a film school when I was younger and I got into video games by accident. And so I thought, if I were to make one film in my life, it seems like this is probably the one to, to do first. And so that kind of all came together. Yeah. When did you start uh, making the film? And what was that initial? How did you navigate? I always like to ask between <laughs> um, using archival footage and, you know, making sure there was a vitality of like live interviews as well. Yeah, it, it was interesting. So, you know, being a first time documentary director, um, I didn't really know where to start. Like, you know, it's like I, you know, I had read some books here and there and things like that, but I didn't really, you know, know, understand the whole process. So I actually worked a little backwards than probably what I should have done or what most people would do, which is I interviewed all the people first to get the stories. And then from there, you know, hope that I had the right archival materials to match up with it. And, uh, and I got extremely lucky. I, you know, I, I got the interviews, got a good idea of where the stories were going to be or what directions we're going to go into. Um, and then I came upon and I had some some of my own archival materials. But then on top of that, the uh, I, I discovered a treasure trove of videos that our former vice president at Midway was able to acquire after Midway had gone bankrupt. And he get and he let me have access to it. And that was that was amazing. Um, but beyond that, you know, we, once the, the project became more public, I actually had a lot of people who were, let's say, game journalists in the 90s or other people who were videographers who had done work for Midway. Um, they ended up sending me a bunch of materials also. And, uh, and I, seriously, I, I feel very fortunate that the materials I got matched very well with the storylines that I was pursuing, which is, uh, which is very fortuitous. You know, for the next film, I would definitely like, not go in that direction. I learned a lot from it, but and I think my life would have been a lot easier had I, uh, you know, had I done the the reverse, which is find the footage first and then try to figure out the story based on that. Gotcha. Have any of the people at uh, Midway seen the film? And if so, what, what's the reaction among some of the people who've been in in the movie? Yeah. So we we had a uh, we had a screening for the cast and crew um, out here in Chicago. Um, they've been dying to see. I felt so bad that I kept holding off on it. So we had a private screening for them and it was both amazing to get all these people in one room because for, you know, even me, even though I worked with them, I was, I was a total arcade geek of the eighties and stuff. So, you know, and, and obviously in the nineties. And so to be, to have everybody come back for a reunion was great. Um, but I was a nervous wreck. And so, uh, so we did the screening and, and afterwards, you know, they like, it was amazing. They, you know, uh, like this is, you know, it's a documentary. It's not an encyclopedia, so it doesn't have every single detail that that they might be thinking about. But the the best comment that everyone gave was that, you know, man, you really, you, you know, gave the feeling of that era, what it was like to work at Midway, and what it was like to play and 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 produce these games. And so that was really great to hear from them that 
you know, that they felt like I did justice to their story. Yeah, actually, I think you certainly did. For the for people who haven't seen uh, the movie, um, where can they find out more information about it? I know you don't have any news to announce about distribution, but yeah. if they want to be in the know. Where can they go to to keep up with your news? Yeah, so um, you know, I have you know, it, I have a website. It's insertcoindoc.com. Um, that's you know, there's a site up there right now. Uh, and it's getting it's getting redone and everything. But there's um, from there you can basically. Uh, put in your email address and get on the mailing list. And then as news comes in, uh, we'll get that out there. We're also on Twitter, the same uh, handle, insert coin doc. And, uh, and that one's actually very active. So it's, it's just easy to update that on a constant basis. Okay, cool. Um, question on, on LinkedIn asking, what is your favorite game of that era and, and why? Matt, my favorite game of that era, um, I, boy, that's a tough one. But I would have to say that the one that, 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 that I played a lot back then and I still play a lot to this day is NBA Jam. Um, it's a game that, you know, it, like a lot of people know Mortal Kombat, which is still a strong franchise now. And so, but like, I think when you look at a game like NBA Jam, it brought in people who normally don't play video games or arcade games into the arcade to play those games um, because it was such an accessible game of a video, you know, accessible video game, whether you like basketball or not. And to this day, I mean, if you go to any barcade that that are out there, they always have an NBA Jam because it's so approachable and fun to play. You're playing with four people. It's you know, um, it's very social. And um, and you know, like I play with my kids. You know, they were able to pick it up right away. And so, yeah, to this day, I think I still think it's one of the best games ever made. Totally, and uh, I agree with you. That's one of my favorites. I love the uh, <laughs> Boom Shakalaka. Um, oh yeah, <laughs> well, it, it's funny. But um, my my youngest daughter one day she said, she said "boom shakalaka" to me, <laughs> and I and I immediately thought like, "What like what were you, like where did you get that from?" And, I, and my assumption was NBA Jam. And it turns out that she was watching some YouTube video, completely unrelated, and the character was saying that. I mean, it's just it's amazing how bad it's become <laughs> part of you know part of uh, you know mainstream culture at this yeah, point. Totally, uh, we can't we can't uh, not ask about Mortal Kombat yeah. because. That, I remember when that came out and sort of the whole, you know, controversial finishes. I had a Nintendo and like I wanted to like go play on Sega. Um, so what? why did they make that decision? I mean, talk a little bit about making that decision about sort of the, the finishing, the violent aspects and how that was a watershed moment for the gaming industry. Yeah. So, I mean, there's, you know, a couple of things. I mean, one of the things that was really unique about Midway was um, games were made just based off of people's personalities. You know, there wasn't like a grand plan as I'm gonna I'm gonna put this fatality in the game and it's gonna shock people and generate all kinds of PR or anything like that. You know, the designers of the game, they just had a crazy sense of humor. They thought, let's just do something funny and put it in there um, without much more thinking beyond that. And then it just becomes this gigantic thing. You know, the irony of it is that when Mortal Kombat was in the arcade, um, it, it was controversial, but it wasn't really that controversial, you know. So like, you see the screenshot of somebody's head, you know, getting popped off their body. Um, it wasn't a big deal in the arcades, and the main reason was because parents weren't in the arcades; they had no idea that their kids were playing this. And so it wasn't until it came out for the home systems, such as Sega and Nintendo back in the day on the cartridges, that parents suddenly realized that, hey, this is in my living room. Like I had no idea my kids were playing this, and then it became this big deal, and. The funny thing is that, you know, so, you know, that's where the, the ratings for games came you know, out of between, you know, of those games of that era and everything. Um, you know, the funny thing is that at Midway, uh, the designers and everybody, and especially the executives, they loved the controversy. I mean, every time there was a big hoopla about violence and video games, it would, it just like sales just boomed. So it would, you know, and, and, and ironically, you know, the ratings uh, when they came out for games, now, it actually freed up the designers to basically go even more crazy because now they have a rating system in. Um, and so they know, hey, you know what, we're fine with a mature rating because, you know, people are going to buy these games no matter what, but now we're covered. And so it just went, it went crazier from there. Yeah, I'm sure. I sure, sure did. Um, it, it was the game to have. Um, and, you know, one of my favorite bands I have to ask is Aerosmith. What was it like <laughs> making the Aerosmith game and working with that band? That, that was that was insane. So that was um, the the team behind the Aerosmith game Revolution Act. They did the uh, Terminator Two game, and uh, and that was then this was their big follow up. 
Uh, and ironically, it was originally supposed to be a Jurassic Park game that ended up being, um, you know, for whatever reason, turned into this crazy gun game with Aerosmith. And they came in, it, it was, it, you know, they came in the studio for, um, you know, two days of shooting. And uh, and it was the most surreal thing. We, you know, we we had a pretty, you know, not professional, not super professional video studio. I mean, it, it was decent, you know, um, but we had to make sure that we cleaned that up. We gave them a proper dressing room catering and everything is all the fancy stuff that you know that we never had when we were shooting our own game but you know when you have aerosmith then you have to you have to go completely hollywood for them um but they came in and they were they were the nicest people I and mean, they came in they were very patient about things they hung out with us you know and um they you know this is all new to them and it's it just ironic because aerosmith they always were into technology I and mean, they had a pc game um wait you know based on them way before any other band would ever do something like that and uh but they were totally game on everything you know they came and they did looping sessions with us they did all the digitizing thing they did anything we told them to do um and they just you know completely trusted the uh the team yeah yeah what is the um it's, it, was, it was an awesome game when um when you think about the gaming industry today you know there is an adult gaming um, adults who game that's like a yeah. there's, it's almost like an industry in a way uh, what is the um, you know explain a little bit about the fall of midway and uh, the rise of other like who's picked up the baton in terms of the gaming industry boy you know it's i mean so like with the fall of midway a lot of it was um you know just you know the world changed you know arcades had their time, uh, but they were very expensive to play. You know, I mean, if you you, know, you talk about you, you went to an arcade a lot when you know when you're a kid. I'm thinking of all the quarters that you sank in. You know, and like arcade games, they're meant to take a quarter every 40 to 45 seconds, which is hugely expensive. So, like with the with the rise of CD-ROMs, um, that's when the technology shifted away from arcade. Arcades used to be at the top of the food chain; they were like the most powerful machines. Now the PlayStation comes out, um, the Nintendo 64 comes out, and they start taking over. And so that contributed to the fall of arcades, you know, and then the internet came around and, you know, people would just would rather be playing online with each other as opposed to being in an arcade standing next to somebody who's sweating by you or something. So a lot of that ended up, you know, shifting around and then companies such as, you know, EA and Activision, they were able to make these larger games. You know, it's like, I think a great example of a, of a game that kind of straddled between arcade and home games was the the Tony Hawk Pro Skater series. It was very arcade in nature, but they had, you know, uh, you know, but they were big games. And so suddenly people were like, hey, I can pay $50 for a game and play for hours and hours on end. Why do I need to leave my house to go, you know, to go play an arcade game where I'm constantly sinking money and they're incredibly hard to play. So, you know, the world kind of shifted and culture shifted and the arcades were just kind of at that point, you know, doomed. Um, until much later on in the, you know, in the late 2000s when they kind of came back more as like family entertainment centers. Yeah. Yeah. And who today do you think is the leading innovator of games? I know there's so many, uh, but. Yeah. You, know, you know, it's interesting. So it, that's a tough one to say. I mean, you know, all the big companies like EA and Activision, they do innovative things for sure. Um, but the way I look at it is they're kind of like the, the Disney's of the world where they're making big maps entertainment projects and they'll innovate but they can only they're, they're only going to push it so far they don't want to alienate the you know a mainstream audience i think where you're seeing a lot of in innovation uh similar to what midway did what are a lot of these indie game developers and there's some incredible uh independent games out there that are getting good distribution and good sales that um that are really pushing the envelope when it comes to when it comes to gameplay and i always say that midway back in the 90s um, even though we were part of a large company, our attitude was very much like uh, like indie developers. They're like I always say that we're like the most well-funded indie um, game company of any era. And so that's how you get a game like NBA Jam or Mortal Kombat. You know, you can't do it based off of people marketing people telling you what to do. You base it off of you know very creative people thinking to themselves, what's going to make me laugh or what's going to entertain me, and putting that into a game. Yeah, yeah, totally. Well, you know, great. Uh, movie insert coin uh, it's just an incredible project um, <clears throat> what is next for the project I know you're kind of in a wait and see but what do you want to happen yeah. next you alluded to it at the beginning but maybe if there's more detail you let us know 
Yeah, no. So, I mean, you know, we're working through uh, just distribution right now and, you know, looking at worldwide sales and just trying to make sure we get, you know, you know the best you know, exposure and and uh, and the, what makes the most business sense for it. So that's literally in progress right now. We're still waiting on if the world opens up uh, for film festivals. So, we, you know, like I said earlier, after South by, we got a lot of other film festivals interested in screening it. So but as we've been going along, they've been either canceled or postponed. So it's kind of a wait and see attitude when it comes to film festivals. I still want to get it into a theater as you know, so people can enjoy it as a group because ultimately you know, that's always every filmmaker's dream. Yeah. So we're kind of, we're trying to figure that out. And um, something that, oh, you know, the, one of the things that, um, that's coming up in the short term uh, next week is I'm doing a talk at Games Beat Summit um, and they've, they've gone online with their summit and uh, we're trying something kind of innovative. Uh, we're going to show a couple of clips from the film to the attendees, um, but also people who have VR headsets will be able to watch these clips in a, a VR theater. Um, and it's kind of a test to see how that feels. Um, I'm, I'm way into VR. And so the idea of people being avatars in a VR theater, looking at watching this on big screen, I think is, uh, is pretty cool. So that's, uh, that's being worked on with Oculus right now. Awesome. Well, I'm looking forward to seeing it. I hope to see you on the film um, festival circuit yeah. uh, when the world normalizes. Um, I think we were we were got into Cleveland too, so it, was, it would have been awesome to catch up in person. Yeah. But um, thanks so much for being on uh, one of the inaugural episodes of the Quarantine Film uh, series. And uh, mm -hmm. I wanted to just thank you and your incredible um, team and for putting the incredible project together. Wish you all the luck with it, Josh. Way everyone, check out Insert Coin Doc. Uh, Dot com and for everyone else uh keep it you know locked here because we'll be bringing you more um more concerts more film conversations and always share with us your feedback on how we can uh, who you want on the show and how to improve it and we'll try to make it happen all right thanks so much have a great day Stay thanks home.